Heavenly Father, we rejoice today. Our hearts are just filled with gratitude and wonder, amazement, joy, and hope when we think about the fact that Jesus is alive. What an awful, agonizing death that he went through and how the ugliness of our sin was demonstrated on that cross. Amen. But how the full pardon is the wrath, the holy wrath, of a holy God was poured out on Jesus so that it would not be poured out on us. And I pray that you will help us today, those of us who put our trust in Jesus, to rejoice the fact that all of our sins were forgiven and that Christ, His resurrection, was almost the receipt of uh, acceptance to let us know that you have accepted His payment so that we can rejoice be forgiven and know that we're forgiven Amen. and that Christ lives in us and for yes. us. I pray now that you are blessed in this worship service. Help us to sing with enthusiasm and joy as we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. Yes. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us.
and they prepared it for burial the best way they could. They didn't have much time. They just had a few hours, really. And uh, in a hurried way, they took it and they laid that body in the tomb of Joseph that is, he had prepared for himself. And so, uh, in all four Gospels, we have the story of the resurrection. But uh, there are a few things that Matthew tells us that Luke doesn't tell us. There are some things Luke tells us that Matthew doesn't tell us. There are some things that John tells us that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't tell us. So we'll try to put all those together the best we can. Uh, but we're going to focus on John's Gospel this morning. But, but uh, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27 that the next day, this is verse 62, kind of give you an idea of what happened after Jesus was crucified, taken down from the cross, and put in the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, this was actually two days after the crucifixion, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered with Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said that while he was still alive, that after three days, I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he's risen from the dead. And then the last fraud will be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go Make it as secure as you can. I like that. It says you just go, you do everything you can do to make sure that that body stays in the grave. So they went and they made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, as we put all the Gospels together, we get this picture in our mind that these guards were there at the tomb. There was a, a group of them, and they were guarding the tomb. And suddenly, uh, probably on Saturday evening, there was an earthquake, just kind of a localized earthquake. And when the ground shook, the stone rolled away from the tomb and the guards passed out. I probably would have to. They just collapsed. And then when they woke up and saw that the stone was gone and they saw that the tomb was empty, they thought, oh my, we have been derelict in our duty. And they knew what happened to Roman soldiers if they fail to fulfill their responsibility, they could be in serious, serious trouble, could even be executed. So they went to the chief priests and they said, we don't know what happened. We, we collapsed and we woke up. The tomb was empty. And this all really on Saturday by the way, I don't believe Jesus rose on Sunday morning. I believe he rose on Saturday evening, sometime after 6 o'clock. That was when the three days were actually up. Because the women didn't go to the tomb until early the next morning. He was already gone and he was already risen when that happened. So these soldiers, they collapsed. All this happened on Saturday evening, a little earthquake. And, the and these soldiers go to the chief priest and said, uh, we don't know what to do. And the chief priest said, well, I tell you what, let us pay you a large amount of money. We're going to bribe you, and you tell everybody that uh, his disciples came and stole his body. And that way, uh, we'll cover for you. You won't get in trouble with your superiors and you can cover for us. And, and that's what happened. That's, that's, and that was a, a lie that actually got circulated a little bit back during the time that Jesus rose. And 
And yet nobody could find the body. Nobody could find the body. And uh, the disciples would not have stolen the body. Had they stolen the body, then they would have had to have hidden it somewhere, and then they would have known that they were all a bunch of liars. And all of these men ended up dying for the truth that Jesus was alive. In fact, that was the major <laughs> message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in that first century, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose from the dead. And they said, out of this, we are witnesses. We know that he's alive. So, the next morning, there are some women who had agreed during the night that early in the morning they would go to the tomb and they would uh, see if there was any way they could offer some kind of service or ministry to the body of Jesus. And so they had agreed to go early in the morning. Now Mary Magdalene actually went earlier than the others. I know the Gospels tell us, Matthew and Mark tells us that the three women were there, but John tells us that Mary went first by herself. While it was still dark, she went. And so that's what I want us to look at today in John's Gospel, beginning in, this is in chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, by the way, the Jewish days began at 6 p.m., the evening and the morning were counted as a day. So the Sabbath would end at 6 p.m. on Saturday, and the first day of the week would begin at 6 p.m. on Saturday. But they didn't go to the tomb at 6 p.m. on Saturday. They waited until early in the morning of the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And can you imagine the shock it must have been? This is before the other women got there. Mary arrives, and she's the first thing she sees in the early, early, barely light of the day is that big, massive stone had been rolled out of the way. She didn't go in the tomb. She just saw that the tomb was empty. And she did <clears throat> what maybe you would have done. She ran. It says, so she ran, and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. This John, the way John always identifies himself <clears throat> is that other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. And so she ran to Simon Peter and to John, and she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they've laid him. So she's shocked at this amazement. She assumes that grave robbers have come. That either the priests have come and taken him out and hidden his body, which wouldn't make any sense. They knew the disciples hadn't come, but she said somebody has moved. He's not there. The tomb is empty. And so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. And both of them <coughs> were running together. But the, first, the other disciple outran Peter. Now we assume that Peter was a little bit older, probably in his 30s, and John was maybe in his late teens or early 20s. And so he's in a little better shape, and he outran Peter and both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. But he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. Sounds like Simon Peter, doesn't it? Yeah. He said, I'm not just looking, I'm going in to get a better look. And he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, 
not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. So this would indicate that somebody had actually folded this thing up and moved it and put it in another place. And then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. He believed. He's, he's the one, by the way, who wrote this book, the Gospel of Luke. And he said, at that moment, I believed what Jesus had said, what Jesus had done, and that he was, in fact, alive. For as yet, they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. Isn't that amazing? Jesus had told the disciples at least three times, we know for sure three times, that he was going to be taken to Jerusalem, that he was going to be arrested, he was going to be turned over to wicked men, to the Gentiles, and that he would be beaten and mocked and crucified and buried. And then he said, and, and then I will rise again on the third day. Why do you suppose they didn't believe that? Well, it's kind of hard to believe. You know, we look back on it now, and it all makes sense because we know the rest of the story. But can you imagine if uh, if, if your pastor got up here and said, hey, <clears throat> uh, next month, these uh, corrupt government officials are going to come in and they're going to arrest me and they're going to take me to trial and they're going to execute me. But don't worry, in a few days I'll, I'll be alive again. What would you think? You'd think, poor old brother Nick. <laughs> He's lost his mind. He's delusional at best and uh, uh, maybe crazy at worst. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And always count on Linda. I hate to do that because <clears throat> when I was a little boy, our pastor would drink some water while he was preaching. And I'd always think, I want some, but uh, <laughs> I never could have any. So I, I've always felt a little strange about it. But, but I'm going to do it Got a little tickle in my throat here. So, uh, so I don't think it's too strange that the disciples, as they would hear Jesus talk, you know, Jesus said lots of things that they didn't understand. Amen. He he made lots of statements. He told lots of parables and lots of stories, and then they would say, uh, "What do you mean by that?" Just like in Matthew 13, he told six parables, and and the disciples listened to those parables, and then Jesus said. Have you, have you understood everything I said? And the disciples said, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we got it. And then Jesus said, well, well try this one. And he said, uh, the, gospel, the kingdom of God is like a wise householder who takes out of his treasures things new and things old. And I bet all the disciples looked at one another. Did you get that? What do you think that meant? And then Thomas said, I'm still trying to figure out what that first one meant. And there were just lots of things Jesus said that the disciples just didn't get. They just didn't grasp. And so when he tells them, the Son of Man is going to be crucified and buried, but he'll rise again from the dead. They must have just looked at each other like, I thought he was the Son of Man. Who's he talking about? And so it's amazing that after the crucifixion, the burial, and even the resurrection, the empty tomb, the disciples still didn't get it. And the next verse lets us know they didn't get it. Amen. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Can you imagine going to the tomb, finding it empty, and say, well... <clears throat> Let's go back home. And at this point, they still were incredulous. And that is surprising, but it's even more surprising to me 
that after 2,000 years of solid testimony that Jesus is alive, millions of changed lives, Amen. that still people today do not believe in Jesus. That is amazing to me. Do you believe? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? Amen. And that he rose from the dead right. as justification, as a way of saying the payment has been accepted by heaven and now forgiveness <laughs> is available. Right. When Jesus died on that cross, was laid in that tomb, we don't know all that happened in the spirit world during that time, but we know that the spirit of Jesus didn't die, only the body of Jesus died. And in the spirit, Jesus, the Bible teaches, actually entered into the place of death. He went into what we sometimes call the underworld, Hades, Sheol, whatever, you know. He went into the place of death. And there he confronted the powers <coughs> of death and the powers of sin Amen. and the powers of guilt and the powers of Satan. And Jesus, in a confrontation with death itself, when death says, now I have conquered, I have won, I have you, Jesus, and then suddenly a little earthquake begins to shake Two rolls away, and Jesus said, I'm walking out of here. And Dad says, No, no way, you can't. <clears throat> and in my mind, I figured that Jesus just reached over and pulled the stinger out of Death's tail and said, I'll just take that with me. And so now the Bible says, Death no longer has a sting for the Christian. Amen. Oh, Death, where is your sting? Jesus ripped it out when he left that tomb and came alive again. The disciples went back home, but Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels. Somebody said to me, well, the Bible says an angel spoke with well, if there were two angels, there had to be at least an angel, didn't there? And so one of the gospel writers is focusing on what one angel said and the other is focusing on the two angels. And there were two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. And having said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. And again, you wouldn't, be, she, you wouldn't expect her to be expecting Jesus. She turned, and Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed that he was the gardener there in the, in the garden. And she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and then I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, just one word. He called her by her name, Mary. How many times had she heard Jesus call her name? I don't know if it's exactly like he's portrayed in The Chosen, but in The Chosen, the first episode of The Chosen, Mary Magdalene is the featured character there, and she is possessed with all these demons, and she is just a violent, horrendous person. And as she is walking away, actually going to maybe take her life, Jesus says, Mary. Stops. She drops the cup that she's holding. And she turns around and looks at him. 
And he says, fear not. I have redeemed you. You are mine. Amen. And he casts out of her those seven demons that had tormented her for so long. Now, I don't know that it happened exactly that way, but I do know that many, many times during the three years that she walked with and knew Jesus personally, he must have called her name many times. And this time, he just says that one word, Mary. And she instantly knew who it was. And she said to him in Aramaic language, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go and tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. Amen. I think it's significant in some ways that, uh, that women were the last at the tomb, at, at the cross, and first at the tomb. It's almost like God is just putting a stamp of authority and approval on womanhood. And I know that in many cultures, and even in our American culture for many, many years, women were looked at with kind of second class, lower than, underneath the uh, uh, authority of men, below those beneath in dignity. They had their roles and so forth like that. But it's almost like Jesus 2,000 years ago was saying, I want you to know women are just as significant, important, and valuable to me as any male disciple. And I just think it's significant that Jesus spoke from the cross to his mother and that women were the last ones to leave the cross and the first ones to come to the tomb. So, if I were a woman, I'm actually thankful that I'm not because I enjoy being a man, but if I were a woman and if you're a woman, then I think you can say, yay, Jesus, you absolutely have uh, authenticated my significance my value and my purpose in life. So she went to the disciples and told them that Jesus was alive and reported all these things. Now, there's a lot more to this chapter, but I, I just want to take just a minute and say, what is the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus? How does it really affect us? What does it do? In just a few minutes, you're going to see Isabel in her water up here. And she's going to fold her hands and she's going to look like somebody who has died. And I'm going to bury her in water. And then I'm going to raise her up out of that water. And when that water falls away from her face, it's like she has died and has been buried and has been raised to life. And that's what the Bible says baptism actually signifies. Amen. But it signifies it because it is a declaration of faith in one who did die Amen. and was buried and he rose again. Amen. And so every baptism is a declaration of the fact that that Christ died for our sin. Right. Yeah. That he was buried, dead, really dead. And that on the third day, God raised him yeah. from the dead. Amen. And so, what was the purpose of all that? You know that when Jesus was hanging on that cross, your sin, my sin, the sin of all those that were his 
were all laid upon Jesus. Amen. We cannot comprehend it. How that in one small period of time, the sins from stretch to stretch were all compressed together Amen. and laid on Jesus. That's right. And the penalty for that sin was death. Amen. The Bible makes it clear. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth deserves to die. And in that moment, Jesus took my punishment and he died in my place. Amen. He paid the debt that I owed. And in that few hours on the cross, the wrath of God against sin, my sin, the wrath of God that will be expressed in hell for all of eternity on those who do not believe. The wrath of God fell upon Jesus. And in one sense, he actually was in hell while he was on that cross Amen. paying for sin. And when he said his last words from the cross, it is finished. Amen. That's the Greek word that means paid in full. Amen. The debt is fully discharged. Right. And then he was buried. And that resurrection was almost like a, a receipt from heaven. God's way of saying, payment fully accepted, and now you can go free. Praise the Lord. That's the gospel, folks. The gospel is that all of our sin, that, that he who knew no sin, became sin for us Amen. in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. You know what it's required to go to heaven? Perfect righteousness. Amen. The only ones that can enter into heaven are those who have absolute perfect righteousness. Amen. No sin to condemn them. Amen. Does that sound pretty hopeless? So well, then how does anybody get in? Well, that's the gospel. Amen. Is that all my sin was put on him. He paid for it. And then his perfect righteousness is placed on me. So that the Bible says there is therefore now no condemning sin, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. It always amazes me why everybody doesn't want to be a Christian. You will either die in sin or you will trust the one who died for sin. Amen. Your sin will all be punished. It will either be punished on the cross or to be punished in eternal hell. Amen, amen. So I would just ask you today, on this Easter Sunday, it's Resurrection Sunday, have you put your trust in Jesus? Do you believe that He died for your sin? If you do, you need to rejoice and say, Hallelujah, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, right. is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord of my soul. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. I thank you that you rolled the stone away, not so Jesus could get out. He could have walked through that stone. You rolled the stone away so others could get in and see that he was alive, that he was, wasn't there. I thank you that what you accomplished for us on the cross is sufficient for every sin.
There is no sinner so great and no sin so great that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot totally obliterate. And I pray today that if there's even one person here who has not put their trust in Jesus, that they might come here in this next few minutes and say, I want to trust in the one who died for me. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing an invitation to him. It's called I Surrender All. All to Jesus I Surrender. And if during this song you would like to come and put your trust in Jesus, or even to ask questions, say, I still don't quite understand it. What do I do? Then you come. I'll be glad to pray with you, <coughs> with you here. We'll ask Isabel to go ahead and uh, be getting ready for me. All right. So let's stay out together as we sing.
Jackson? Or is that both of you? Both of you. I thought so. I didn't think that two hands could do all that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, I'm excited anytime we have a baptism. Because as I said earlier, it is a visible portrayal of death, burial, and resurrection. Means I put my trust in the fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, but also affirms the fact that I now identified with Christ by faith. Yes. I have died with Christ, buried with Him, and raised to walk in a new quality of life. Praise the Lord. And it also is a picture of the fact that someday, when we die, our bodies will be buried. But that's not the end. Jesus will come again and we will be raised physically Amen. to meet the Lord and be with Him forever. So, Isabel, it's going to come and be baptized this morning. This is Isabel Cornero, and I'm going to ask. Any of her family that are here, will you stand while she's being baptized? No, all right. Isabel, what is your profession of faith? I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and for my sins. Amen. Because of this profession of faith, and because Jesus has commanded us to follow him in baptism, I baptize you as my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised. Father, we thank you so much for the divine gift that you've given us in the Son of Jesus Christ. Thank you. We thank you, Father, that we know that we have hope. That's and right. we look forward to that day once again yes. when we'll be with you in eternity. Amen. And so we ask that you continue to guide us, to forgive us, and to strengthen us That's right. as thank we you. fellowship with your Holy Spirit. Amen. And we ask these things now. In your merciful and mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
service tonight, so enjoy time with your family on this resurrection. <coughs>